Grace and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's still Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Does that get a little softer each week? <laughs> is that not the way life is sometimes, though? That on Easter Sunday, we have the victory of Easter right in front of us. Yeah, someone was saying to me a, a little bit ago, he said, Easter was only two weeks ago? I'm like, yeah, it's only two weeks. It seems like it was longer. Probably there's been a lot of life in between Easter and today. Just reminds me that each and every one of us, we are a part of a great big restoration project. We need to be restored continually. And as we talk about restoration in our lives, restoration in our souls, restoration in our walk of faith, and restoration so that our joy might be restored as we experience the salvation that Jesus has brought us. I think today, as we look at the two disciples who are walking on that road to Emmaus, we get to see their need for restoration as well. It's a day, the day of that first Easter. There's two of them. They've been with everybody that morning, but now they're making their way. They're heading to Emmaus, about seven miles away. They're walking along. Everything is running through their heads, everything that they've experienced. There's been a lot of life that has taken place during that Holy Week. And they're kind of recapping it. And they are sorely in need of some restoration. They keep walking along the road, and they're talking about everything that's happened. And the one thing that they don't know yet, that hasn't sunken in or hasn't been fully revealed to them, is that Jesus truly is alive. And into this scene where they're walking along, Jesus comes. There are times when we go about our lives and we might fail to recognize where Jesus is. I know that sometimes I, I get so wrapped up in things, whatever's going on in my family or, you know, my work, which is, which is you guys. I care, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we get wrapped up well, there's a lot of things we can get wrapped up in. You can get wrapped up in, uh, you know, how, uh, I know some people in this room are wrapped up in how the rays are doing. <laughs> some people are going to be wrapped up on how things are gearing up. In, where I grew up in Indiana, every single day, the news reports were about leading up to this big race during the month of May. And uh, I think it's something called the Indy 500. People get wrapped up in all sorts of things. Maybe your kids have a whole bunch of things that you're wrapped up in, but don't ever lose sight of Jesus, especially if you're getting wrapped up in the things that are maybe not going exactly the way that you planned. And so Jesus comes, and they're so wrapped up in everything, these two disciples. And he comes, he kind of just joins them walking along the way. And he's listening to them. And by God's power, they're kept from recognizing him. And so he engages. He says, so what are you guys talking about now that I've joined you here? And they stop. And they just look straight down. There's the restoration project. There's the evidence of it. If there was a spiritual life inspector coming in to see how things are going, just like when you're buying a house, you get a home inspector, to get a look at what, boy, you would find that the timber has all fallen down. Things have come crashing down for them. They just stop when Jesus asks this question. They don't recognize him yet. And they just look down. And then one of them says, are you the only person who doesn't know about all this stuff? Where? Where have you been the past couple of days? 
are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened? And then Jesus plays along. You, you see how Jesus sometimes strings things out so he can draw us out? Because he really wants to draw us out so that he can get us with his love. He says, what things? Well, it's about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped. Their hope's gone, they think. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. You would think that with all of these details, the rumors of resurrection have been coming in. With all of these details, maybe they could have connected the dots. Something about an angel telling somebody that he's not here, he's risen, that might get your attention. But this shows just how much restoration needs to take place in their lives and in their hearts. And then Jesus talks to them. He gives them some straight talk. He says, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe. You should have believed everything that the prophets had spoken. Didn't you know the Messiah was going to go through all this and then he would enter into his glory? And then Jesus opens up the scriptures for them. Beginning with Moses, that would be like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. He starts with them and he goes through all the prophets. And he says, see, this is what pointed to Jesus. This is what pointed to Jesus. This is what pointed to Jesus. And really what he's saying is, these are all the things that pointed to me. And he explained to them what it was that all the scriptures said concerning himself. Well, they get to where the two disciples are going to be staying overnight. And they stop. And Jesus acts like he's going to keep on going. And they say, well, why don't you come and stay with us? They've just been hanging on his every word. Tell us more. Come. Stay with us. It's almost evening. And so when they sit down at the table, Jesus takes the bread. He gives thanks. He breaks it. And he gives it to them. Kind of reminded them of something, didn't it? Another time when Jesus gave thanks, broke the bread. And then they recognize him. It's the Lord. And he disappears from their sight. Well, those two disciples, they're not going to Emmaus anymore. They're heading back to Jerusalem. And while probably mopey as they're heading towards Emmaus, they're Russian because they've seen the Lord. There's something about encountering Jesus that simply changes everything. And so they run back to Jerusalem, they, and they hear the news. The Lord's risen. He's appeared to Simon. And then they get to tell their story of everything that happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Their hearts are on fire because Jesus has opened up the scripture to them, and they've seen Jesus now. Now, there's three things I want to talk about regarding this story and regarding our stories. Because we all have our stories. We all have our need to be restored. Some weeks, things are going great. Some weeks, things aren't going so great. For some of us, there are challenges that we, we wouldn't even tell anyone else. They would have no idea what types of challenges we might be against. But for others of us, 
we wear our challenges on our sleeves. Sometimes it's our badge of honor. But for all of us, we have a tremendous need because we live in this fallen world, a tremendous need to be restored by the one who can restore us by his power. So the first thing I want you to think of or know and to carry with you today is to expect to encounter Jesus. Hey, for those of you who are really savvy, some of you are really bright. That was actually a sermon series that we did. But do you see what happened when those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't expect to see Jesus, and they got what they didn't expect. We should expect to encounter Jesus. He's the one who said of us that he is our God and that he has joined us to himself through the waters of holy baptism. For we are baptized into Christ. And so the old has been buried with Christ and the new has risen. The risen Lord is alive in us. But also, when he gave to his disciples the commandment to make disciples by baptizing and by teaching, he said, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This means that he's with us. Expect to encounter Jesus because he is always with us. He is never far. He is never distant. He is never disconnected to what we're going through in life. He is always, always right there. And we should expect as God's people simply to encounter Jesus every day. Expect to encounter Jesus. He's given his promise that he's with you always. Secondly, Jesus reveals himself. To those two disciples who had been on the road to Emmaus, Jesus reveals himself, first of all, by opening up the scripture to them. This is what has been foretold about me. These are the reasons I went through all of this. It was for you, for your salvation, for your life, to take away the clutch that death has on human beings by tasting death in your stead so that you might have a life that will never end. Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. Jesus sat down with them at the table and revealed himself in the breaking of the bread. He is a God who wants to be known. So many people, they think that if there is a God, that it, it's a God that you can't really know about. Well, that's not the God that we have. The God that we have has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He has come down to this earth so that he would not be distant, so that he could draw us near to him. And not only that, but the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, he has revealed himself in his word, and he comes to us in a special meal when we come to take communion, where Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. Now, we confirmed about seven kids earlier this morning. I was blessed to have one of my own kids be numbered among them. And I asked the kids, what's the, so what? What's the big point about this meal? Well, it's this. That when you feel like you've come disconnected or that the wheels have come off, where do you look for God? Where do you look for Jesus? Maybe you're expecting to encounter him, but you don't know where to look. Well, he says, every time you come to his word, you can encounter him. That's where he's revealed himself. And he said that every time we come to this table, he's there giving himself for us. I can't explain it, 
but when we take the bread, we receive also his body. When we take the wine, we receive also his blood. What could be more powerful to change your life than having Jesus right here? And he is. That's his promise to us. Not only do we expect to encounter Jesus, but he is a God who has revealed himself to us so that we don't have to guess what he's like, so that we don't have to make it up as we go along. You know, I, I read a very interesting article last year, maybe last year and a half. It was about atheists who pray. That kind of catches is strange. I, I thought, who do they pray to? They're atheists praying. But, you know, there's an article in the Washington Post, of all things, about atheists who pray. Well, you know, when you and I pray, we don't have to pray to a nothing. We pray to the one who knows us so intimately because we are his people. He knows everything about us. And as I was saying to the kids in the confirmation service, he knows when you've studied for a test. He knows when you've blown it off. <laughs> he knows that day when you're going into class and you're thinking, I hope that teacher doesn't pick up any paper today. And you're kind of slouching down in your seat and you're hoping they don't call on you either. He knows. He knows when you've had a, a, a disconnect with your parents. That happens occasionally, I'm told, parents and kids. He knows when there's tensions in the family. He knows when there's tensions in the workplace. He knows when the wheels have fallen apart. And he's revealed that you don't have to be a perfect person to come to him. He comes to gather you into his arms, imperfect though you may be. And the perfection that you and I find someday when we go to meet him face to face is going to be the perfection that he himself has wrapped around us. He has revealed himself to us as a God of love, a God of redemption, a God who restores our souls. Thirdly, as we come to Jesus, as we encounter him, and as he reveals himself, he wants us to come with hearts on fire. You know, there's a lot of things you can be passionate about in this life. You can be passionate about your family. That's a good thing. You can be passionate about your job. That's not a bad thing. You can be passionate about a sports team. Depends on the team whether it's good or bad. I'm, I'm passionate about the NBA playoffs going on. I've got a team that I'm cheering for and pulling for. And you can probably guess if you know NBA basketball, it's not the magic. They're not in the mix. What I'm saying, though, there are so many things you can be passionate about in this life. Why not passionate for the things of God? Has he not shown his passion for you and me? So passionate was he that he came and he walked this earth, he healed people, he rose the dead, raised the dead, he cared, he listened. He spent time with his disciples. He went to the cross. He suffered. We call that his passion. He died. He rose again. He's alive. He's victorious. Why not be passionate for him? Because he has put it all out there. Or as they sometimes say in basketball playoffs, he left it all out on the floor for you and me. But that's not the only part of passion here. I think the words there say, he sets our hearts on fire. You know, having passion for God isn't something that you just have to muster up. When you know Jesus, how much he loves you, to what extent he would go to make you one of his own, that does something in us. And even in those days when we don't feel it the way we might feel it another time, have you ever felt it? And it's just burning, that passion. And then the next day, maybe it's not. 
that's okay. It's not that something changed about God. It's just the world in which we live is a tough place to maintain that passion. Stay connected with Jesus. Always expect to encounter him. Look for him in his word. Remember that he's promised to be with you always. Come to the table. Come to be with the fellowship of God's people. Isn't it interesting? The Emmaus Christians, didn't, those two who were going off to Emmaus, they didn't keep going that way. They wanted to be with the family of God. And no, know, know this beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God has call, who has called you and me to follow after Jesus is the one who will supply all the strength for us to do so, all the love for us to show his love in this world. He will be the one who ignites the fire in our hearts and through his power, he's the one who will keep it burning. Wasn't it, wasn't it when Jesus was getting ready to be baptized, John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so you have Jesus. Let him burn brightly. Don't, don't even put out the flame. But let him set your life and the world ablaze with his love. In Jesus' name, amen.